And welcome back to Face to Faces. And today, two more faces. Smart, interesting, great depth of topic, and it's Heritage Month. So here we are thinking about what does our country stand for? Why is it in a mess? Is it moving in any sort of positive direction? I've got two experts. One is a constitutional lawyer. David O'Sullivan is a veteran broadcaster and an old friend. He'll introduce our very special guest, and I'm going to step out of the way and leave it to the experts. If you can trust me with that, enjoy the content. Off you go, Dave. Okay. Luana Klauso, I don't even know where to begin introducing you because there you wear so many hats. I'm, I'm going to go with lawyer and constitutional lawyer to be more precise, but I could say feminist, activist, author, all of those I feel are completely appropriate. For you, which, which feels most comfortable on your so shoulders if I'm to put a label on you? Um, I want to claim writer as a label, but I just want to spend some time on the constitutional lawyer and even though I'm not practicing constitutional law right now, that was a hard earned <laughs> label <laughs> and I don't want to give it up. For me, it's not about where I am right now. It's about something I fought for and that I wanted and I may not be in that space right now. It's kind of like how doctors get called doctors even out of practice. It's because we know the time and effort that went into that and it's, it's near and dear to my heart. Well, if I could just spend a couple of seconds on that, because I've just finished re reading uh, Dick Hong Mostanaki's uh, second part of his memoirs, All Rise, and he I'm described, so oh, what a book, and, uh, and what a man, and he describes in some detail what it takes to become a constitutional court judge, but he pays a huge amount of tribute to the judge's clerks who do so much work. Now, you were a judge's clerk, if I understand it right, Edwin Cameron was uh, what do you call him? Your, your principal? Your judge? I call him my judge. He wants me to call him Edwin. It's complicated. In oh. private, I call him Edwin. In public, I call him judge because I don't want other, especially black people who see us interact, think I'm being disrespectful by calling someone of his stat stature Edwin. <laughs> Absolutely. He's justice if it's a constitutional law matter and Edwin if it's a gay rights matter was the rule that he and I had established. But I realized the, the depth of knowledge that you need, the work ethic that you that is required to do that job, your understanding of the constitution and the constitutional law. You're summarizing cases for the judge. You are so involved in the judge's work your understanding of the constitution of the rights and the obligations i think goes far deeper than most of us when you look at the constitution as it is applied today the way people think about it and in, uh, interact with the constitution is it fulfilling its full potential do you believe luando it's i don't think there'll ever be a time where we ever say it's fulfilling its full potential because that would be almost like a state of perfection. And I don't think that is um, possible. And um, I think we could do more with it in that um, even a simple thing like the preamble to the constitution, a lot of people don't even know the vision articulated there. A lot of people don't even have a copy of the constitution. So I think where we are falling short is information. And also I think you know, when people experience something, I mean, before this interview, we were talking about hair and the clicks incident and what's happening there. A lot of people know that they want to do something, but they don't know what, they don't know how to articulate what it is that has been violated. And I think that, you know, the constitution needs a lot of discussion around it and the different ways in which it shows up outside of taking someone to court. You know, um, just knowing your entitlements and your responsibilities. And I think until we get that right, you know, until everyone almost like pulls it out of their shirt pocket or their jacket pocket, we can never say it's fulfilling its full potential. But having worked at the court, it was so inspiring. Just seeing ordinary people, you know, a story that I like to tell all the time, someone like Tembikila Mangai, who was a mine worker, whose rights had been violated by a big mining company, instead of 
you know, just taking, you know, the, the, the stipend that they paid him at the end of his tenure with that mining company because he could no longer work because he had silicosis, he had a terminal disease. They sent him home with a stipend because apartheid era legislation, which was still intact in our constitutional democracy, just said that the, the mining companies, all they had to do is pay him 16,000 rand and that was the extent of their obligation. And it foreclosed Mangai pursuing general dam damages against this uh, mining company. He felt that something was wrong. It can't be that in a constitutional democracy, after working for more than 20 years, that I contract a terminal illness and I'm given 16,000 rand and told, home, and told to go home and die. So he had a sense that there's unfairness. You know, he asked a lawyer about it. The lawyer took his case on pro bono. And the, the, the case actually made, it, made its way all the way to the Constitutional Court. And we ended up with a judgment that changed not only the material conditions of Mangai's life, but everyone in a similar uh, position, leading to the biggest class action lawsuit. And th th that's a, a case that I like talking about because you see someone using a constitution and you see a change, a definitive change in the material conditions of their lives. But unfortunately, Mangai died before we handed down the judgment. But so many people have benefited from the work that he put in using the Constitution. So I think there's so many inspiring uh, stories that people don't know about of how the Constitution has changed people's lives and our lives. I think it's a, it's a great example. Uh, and it, it, you, you've raised a number of issues there. Um, if we're talking about the incidents that are paramount in the uh, in the news at the moment and it is this whole case of the the racist advert put out by clicks and then we've got the EFF protests which in some cases have turned violent and when I look at the uh, to and fro of arguments that are taking place and I realize social media is not the not ever an, an, uh, a place where precise debate ever takes place it's a very emotional place but people are claiming constitutional rights on both parts on both sides so for example somebody will castigate the EFF for the violence that has occurred and the EFF will respond by saying but it is our constitutional right to protest which it is I think what mi is missing in this discussion is obligations you do have your constitutional rights but there are obligations you need to fulfill I th that tends to get lost in the debate about rights doesn't it and there's a surely an obligation not to infringe other people's rights. There's a, an obligation not to break the law, which seems to get lost in this rather frenetic uh, emotional debate. And that's why, you know, I respect the judges of the Constitutional Court and what they do, because oftentimes it's a weighing up of conflicting rights and principles and trying to make sense of that. And uh, saying in that situation, which one outweighs the other, you know, uh, yeah. but with the understanding that they're both important. And I just want to say this, that constitutional democracies are not the easiest uh, framework to live within, precisely because of responsibility and precisely because we say that our constitution is supreme. That means so many things and has so many unintended consequences to people who've bought into a constitutional democracy. I'm black, I'm female, I'm Kosa, right? And when you say, and I, I'm... Um, I don't know if I should say this because I'm not quite sure if I am. I'm Christian. Oh, go on. Say it. <laughs> I'm Christian. You know, I strive to live in accordance to the Christian religion. Mm -hmm. And then I'm a constitutional lawyer. And the constitution, and, you know, think of it as being Chief Justice Mukhoeng Mukhoeng, whose faith is pretty much well known and whose faith was in the middle of the debate of whether he should be Chief Justice because in a number of judgments, he quoted the Bible and he used it as a reference, right? In a constitutional democracy, we're trying to forge a collective identity. And in doing that, it means foregoing certain parts or saying that one part, which is the constitutional part, trumps your religion and it trumps your culture, right? There have been many instances where the court says your cultural right is subordinated by the constitution because it's in violation of the right to equality or the right to expression, right? That creates a lot of tension in a constitutional democracy. And uh, we, we've bought into this because it affords me certain things that I'm glad to have, but it also requires me to understand what it means to live in a society that says that the constitution is supreme. So the EFF, for example, 
is going to have it both ways because they're going to say the right to equality or unfair discrimination has been infringed. But also don't forget the part of the constitution that speaks about the rule of law and acting in accordance to the law and not outside of it. So if you're in, you must be in. You can't be in to, this, to the extent that you like it and it protects you. But when it prohibits certain behavior on your part, you can't be like, oh, that part is inconvenient. I don't acknowledge it. And sometimes the EFF does that, even with land grants. You know, you can't invoke the constitution and go to the constitutional court for the Nkanda judgment, right? Which was in their favor, which was a good judgment. At the same time, say that you're a proponent of land grabs because that land was taken at a time where there was no rule of law. So you think that you have the right to take it back. It's either you believe in the system or you don't. It's Heritage Month, and let's talk a, a little bit about Heritage Month. And we would like to celebrate heritage, but in uh, South Africa at the moment, where issues of racism, which come out of our, our, our deep and fractured past, are looming large, where we look at a time where roads must fall is a, a huge debate, where we've got statues commemorating the colonial past, which are still standing, uh, and debates about what should happen there. I sometimes wonder just how difficult it might be to celebrate heritage when there's so much that needs to be dealt with first in terms of coming to grips with our past. Do you see our heritage as, as somewhat fractured or do we have enough of, a, of a, a, a history of heritage that there's plenty to celebrate in South Africa, this wonderful mix of cultures and languages? You know, the thing that bothers me about our national holidays is that we really try and limit the role that they play in our lives. And that when I look at, we just had Women's Month, right? Mm. People think Women's Month is a time where you send the women in your life um, spa vouchers and flowers and happy Women's Month. And it's a little bit more political than that. Like if you trace it back to the ninth of August, you know, and what those women uh, were standing for in Pretoria and what that movement was born out of, a lot of the issues that they were fighting for are still issues today. And the month should be talking about how do we expand our understanding of those issues and how do we even expand our definition of women? Because that's something that's topical today, right? And then when, you, when we look at Heritage Month, it's the month where on the 24th of September, people go to work wearing their traditional clothes. And it's much bigger than that. It's, it's much more complex than that. And it is very much about the things that you articulated about where do we come from and the complexities of our heritage. You mentioned Rhodes Must Fall, right? Cecil John Rhodes is a complicated figure. Yes. And what people don't understand is that Afrikaners and black people have something in common when it comes to Cecil John Rhodes, right? In that he represents uh, the imperialism of of, of Britain and the imperialism that oppressed Afrikaners and uh, also impressed, oppressed black people. And for me, it's kind of like, when we talk about Cecil John Rhodes, it's with the complexity that, you know, he represents imperialism, but there's a scholarship that's named after him that so many people that we know have benefited from that scholarship and trying to debate what is my relationship to Cecil John Rhodes if I'm a Rhodes scholar, what does it mean? Someone like Bram Fischer, who's also a complicated figure in our, in our, in our history, has been simplified into just an anti-apartheid figure. He's so complex because it comes from that Africana heritage, right? But he fought on the side of communism while being a, a very wealthy you know, advocate who was on retainer for mining companies, but was a communist, right? So there are all these complications that Edwin, someone we both love, Edwin Cameron, who writes about um, um, Bram Fischer in a way that I wish we could discuss our heritage because he doesn't just glorify Bram Fischer. He talks about all these complexities. And if you take Edwin's approach to Bram Fischer and we apply it to our broader history, you realize there's so many contradictions you know, there's so many gray areas. It's not just the good side and the bad side. We are all complicit in some way or the other. And if we apply that to what is happening with cliques and the hair issue, the insidious thing about apartheid is that it used black people to enforce it. I was talking to someone who said that, you know, the police, when we were at the, when we were at the white only beach, 
the police went to my father and said, take your family home. So all I know is that my father comes to me and says, it's time to go home. We're not supposed to be here. And I'm angry at him because he's now the instrument of enforcement against apartheid, right? And w w when I apply that to hair, it's not so much just white people who've told me there's a problem with my hair. It's because we've internalized that, you know, the thing that there's something wrong with us, that it is my grandmother who said, neaten up your hair, braid it, you know, your, your Afro is messy. It's this, those messages come from black people because we used as instruments of our own oppression, right? And there's a whole lot of complicated thing rather than clicks is bad and we are good and they must be canceled. I'm just saying during Heritage Month, let's use it as a time to have these conversations so that people understand how far reaching something like um, what clicks did how far reaching that has and also how far back it goes and how entrenched it is not only in white people but also in black people and how we've internalized it and let's talk to each other but i'm also a proponent of there's a line and i think clicks now gets it that you can never cross this line again and i think also these conversations have to take place because if we don't have them and we're not having them quite frankly in my view these things keep happening which uh, helps us answer the question why in this time um, so many years after democracy and at a time where uh, debates and protests against racism have taken place all around the world 2020 will be marked by two things COVID and the the worldwide protests against racism how does it keep happening in this country in South Africa and my one of the reasons I feel is because we haven't, particularly white people, haven't confronted the racist past. And I know that there'll be lots of people watching this going, oh, race again, this has come up once again and getting fed up. And that reaction is the reason it keeps coming up because people want to squash it. They say, oh, the past is the past. I don't think that's a good way of handling those things. We need to deal with our past and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission tried to it couldn't fulfill its mandate. I'd like to hear your views on the way racism should be addressed. Let's talk about it even from a corporate space. Can corporates galvanize a debate within their workplace, getting their employees to talk about these things? And if I could give an example of, I know that there are a lot of problems at Cricket South Africa, but one thing that encourages me is the players themselves are all sitting down and having a very frank conversation about each other and about their past so that they can all understand where they come from, what their battles were in the past. Uh, Graham Smith saying, I didn't realize that Makai and Tini would run to practice because yeah. he felt yeah. excluded. These conversations need to take place and they're not. Now I wonder how could corporate South Africa play a role in getting these conversations to take place? You know, uh, just to go back to, where you, to your question of why does this keep happening, it's two things. One is that people are definitely making a choice. You know, um, some people, it's not a mistake. It's not unconscious. It's racism and they choose to do it because um, like for instance, I always talk about blackface. If you don't understand as a white person in 2020, why you should not wear bare face, I mean blackface, you don't want to know. And you're actually saying that you are choosing this behavior and therefore you're gonna suffer the consequences of your choice. And then there's certain things that are pretty much new in the conversation, right, of um, um, racism. And um, or we've got new isms, you know, and we've got uh, things like transphobia, that even as enlightened as I am, that I've fallen foul of transphobia, but I've, I've recognized my blind spot and I've educated myself and I've spoken to people who are transgendered just to know what it is that I've said wrong and why and how I can make sure I don't do that again and to understand them better, right? And um, it's so easy to gain knowledge. It's so easy to gain knowledge. So I think there's some people who just make a, a choice of this is how they wanna live their lives. Ignorance is a choice. You can't just say that I'm ignorant. You're choosing to be ignorant because there's information at your disposal. And the other thing that I wanna say, you know, about how we change things is that when I look at corporate South Africa, if you and I rounded up all the CEOs of the JSC listed companies and we brought them in a room and we asked them a simple question of why is the 9th of August a public holiday? 
where does that come from? Or we ask them, why is the 21st of March a public holiday? Tell me the history of that. It is unbelievable to me that we have leaders of private organizations who do not know the basic history of South Africa, and yet they qualify to lead companies yeah. that operate in South Africa. So for me, it's that history and knowing one's heritage, and not just your own as an individual, but our collective heritage, right? As complicated as it is, there's a place where you can start the journey of knowing our heritage should be a requirement. You can't just be a CEO that just knows the numbers and knows accounting and knows science or whatever. You need to know the socio-political economic situation in which your company operates. You need to be on the pulse of the conversations that are happening. You need to be a politically aware person. You need to know the demographics of this country and the sort of diverse people that live within it and who are in your organization. Because usually these companies hire me because I'm a black woman, I'm closer. They're like parading that around. But once I'm in there, it's pull your hair back. Don't wear open toe sandals. You know, don't speak it's a closer because we don't understand you. So they hire me and they paint me beige so that I fit into an already established culture instead of leveraging the difference that I bring to the organization and using that to strengthen the culture of the organization so that it represents South Africa as a country. Very much like the bench of the Constitutional Court, it's constitutionally mandated that it has to reflect the diversity of the country. And I think every organization needs to approach their hiring in the same way. It's not just public institutions. And also once you hire those people, get to know them, where they come from, what their culture is, and try and incorporate their differences and their culture into the bigger organizational culture. And once you let people feel comfortable and be free to talk and to represent who they are, it will enrich you as a person and it will enrich your company and it will deal with racism. And that a lot of racism sometimes is that people live in silos and they live in the world of their own construction, you know, sort of oblivious to you know, real life. And some of us who work in these predominantly white spaces don't have the confidence to say, hey, you know, in my culture, this is how we do things. This is who I am. These are my beliefs. You need to create an organizational culture where people can show up authentically as themselves. And I'll tell you uh, what happened with clicks should not have space to happen because you've created that environment. Well, many lessons to, uh, for corporate South Africa to learn. I could discuss many other issues with you, Luanda. Our time there, unfortunately, is up. It's been wonderful listening to you and sharing ideas. And thank you very, very much. Thank you, David. And you know, in summary, I think one of the saddest things is what people who aren't engaging are actually missing out on. Look how incredible our country is. We have so much. I am so ignorant and there is no excuse. And you're absolutely right, Luanda. But thank you. Uh, I mean, I've got so much to think about. And I'm, you know, I wanted to talk about this because I want to learn. I want to get better. I want to enjoy the richness and the, of all the fabric of our country. So Luanda, David O'Sullivan, thank you so much. You now can see why I think Luando could make a difference to your thinking. And David O'Sullivan is a great moderator MC. If you would like to engage either of them, Famous Faces, that's us. See you next time on Face to Faces. Thank you both. Thank you.